Uh, let me do a quick poll here. How many people uh, work in some sort of QA or test capacity, SDET, SET, something? Okay, we have a few folks here. How many people work in like operations, SRE kind of thing? Okay, much more. Good, I tailored the talk correctly then. Um, uh, developers? I'm sorry. Um, and last, and but not least, management. Anybody here? A, a couple, a couple folks. So there's some stuff for you. Um, all right, let's get this rolling. Why your next QA job actually will be in operations. So, like, who, who am I? Uh, I've been in the tech scene for 20 plus years, kind of all around the shop, um, uh, mostly in QA, that's where I started, but other things in delivery platforms. Uh, I work at a small clinical research organization called Quintiles IMS, only about 60,000 people. That's kind of my new gig. Uh, before that, some uh, startups, um, some IoT stuff, uh, 12 years at Red Hat, and I began my career at Rockwell Automation doing industrial um, uh, PLC programming software. Um, I'm really actually passionate about engineering processes in Kanban. Uh, I have a background in philosophy, so I did not get a CS degree. Um, uh, I do occasionally DJ, and I love whiskey, especially Japanese whiskey. Uh, some of my info there. So, the preface. Anything I'm going to say is my opinion and does not represent employers past, present, or future. So this talk really came to me after like Jeff Susno's Continuous Quality, What DevOps Means for QA. That was done in like 2013. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, go check out the videos of it, and if you're actually more of a um, QA person and, and see, okay, how, what does this really mean for me and how does it do it? He really says it much better than I can. That being said, I kind of build off of that and kind of talk about uh, the meta trends, if you will, of um, you know, where I see these things going. So what I'm going to posit is today's pipelines, infrastructure, has killed dead traditional testing in organizations. And if you still do it, you won't be for long. Um, the flip side of that, which should be obvious to, to folks, this whole new infrastructure as code thing, that's code. Probably should be tested. Um, and but lastly, for those of us who are still in, 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 in the QA mindset, right? there's a space for us in this feature. Let me talk a little bit about who like testers are at core, because we're we're a little bit different. Uh, we're a little bit strange. So there, this uh, article or this chapter in Beautiful Testing by Linda uh, Wilkinson uh, called "Was It Good for You?" kind of goes out and it's really kind of a lovely. It, it as a tester, it warmed my heart that that somebody actually got me, right? So um, really, that's kind of abstracted into some of the qualities of uh, people who like to break things, right? So a lot of times, since we see broken software all the time, um, we end up having a really kind of twisted sense of humor about breakages. You know, personally, Sev ones make me laugh. It's crazy, it's production software. It's like, wait, the whole thing blew up. That is freaking hilarious. Um, and, you know, we, in general, like breaking things. It's like, it's like, look, look, I, really, it, it's broken. And we especially like taking that back to devs and say, hey, guess what? Doesn't work. Um, we're very curious about things, uh, especially about how we can break things, um, and like doing experimental things to, well, break things, and you know, get more data back on how the system or product is is working. Um, we often have to pick up things very quickly, um, and we're not really political animals. We're not going to say, you know, that code really, I know you tried hard, it, it really isn't good. We're, we're most likely going to say, hey, it's busted uh, here, here, and here, and let's move on. 
So we're not really going to sugarcoat you know, where our release is or something like that for, for management. Management really wants this release to go out on time. We have this really important customer. And it's like, guys, it's just busted. I'm sorry. I didn't write the code. It's broken. So we're going to be kind of truth tellers. Um, and we question everything. We don't trust anybody. Um, I like to say software sucks. We try to make it suck less. So what really is QA's job? And for QA folks in here, you, you can recognize that this is not your job. You're not a quality cop. We don't have any arrest powers. Um, we're not a release, but we don't bless releases. It's like, yes, this release may go out. Um, we're not a gatekeeper. We don't have the, the business context to say, yes, we should release this or not. Um, that's the business's job. And we definitely, definitely are not the people who insure, we're not quality insurance, so we don't make sure that the release really ships with no bugs. What is our job then, if, if it's not that? And people think sometimes that that's what, what we do. But what we really do is, is this. Um, Jeff Sussman puts it as a QA as a mirror, as a boundary spanning mirror, it, the kind of the function that has the holistic view of the system as a whole and, and its parts, right? So it's trying to reflect and focus things about the system to, to all the other parts of the business. Um, I, I kind of boil it down a little bit, and it's to inform the business that the state, what the state of the product is in order for it to make intelligent business decisions. So it's like you come to your t testers, you come to QA, and QA tells you what's up. Um, so do that by designing and running tests and experiments. Um, that's really important, test design. No one likes to talk about that, as well as results interpretation. right? So you don't get bad information back. And the biggest thing folks can do is actually fight confirmation bias. So how does it, that job relate to ops? Like traditionally, like QA and ops should be like besties totally, right? You know, QA is like, is this thing correct? Did the defect get out and affect a, a customer? Ops looking at production, right? Is this thing going to go down? Is this thing going to be stable? Am I going to get paged at 4 a.m., right? If it breaks in production, it, it affects both groups, right? Usually QA gets hammered. Why didn't you catch this? Um, ops is up at you know, 3 a.m., pagers going off. Ah, production's on fire, right? Both of us, both of the groups, distrust development. Dev's like, hey, yeah, just push this out. No problem, no problem. Did pass test? No. No, but, but it's fine, it's fine. Just hot fix it, hot fix it. Hot fix goes be <laughs> beyond both groups and we're just like, what the hell is this? Um, and both in a lot of organizations are undervalued by the business until something goes horribly, horribly wrong. Way back in the time of dinosaurs, uh, the 90s, uh, if, if you think of like waterfall in like traditional QA and silos, you, your QA group, you're just sitting here, you, you get a, a bunch of requirements, if you're lucky, code via trebuchet over the wall, <laughs> slams on you. It's like, oh, we were supposed to get this three weeks ago and we only have a week now. Uh, Consider less than development, or, or worse yet, hey, that, that developer guy that came in for an interview didn't do so well. Put him on the test team. Um, terrible, terrible Andy pattern. Uh, a lot of manual testing here. This, like, before the days of like, really widespread automation tools and frameworks. Um, but really part of the job was to proxy the customer inside of your engineering group. So um, your testers and your QA department had to think like, oh, what is the actual customer going to do? We're really opti optimizing for mean time between failure. So why are we doing that? Because the cost of failure is so high in these days. You're, we're doing physical products. Uh, you have like supply chains. If you have to make a change, it's going to cost a lot of time and money. So you optimize for like, OK, make sure that defect isn't there, is not there. So you break things inside so your customer doesn't have to. So along the days of Agile comes along, it's like, oh, somebody writes a, meta, a manifesto, of course there's going to be a re, you know, revolution. Um, 
And at that time, you start to get online distribution, right? You move away from CDs and floppy disks, and you go to digital downloads. Test automation at this time really kind of gets more and more widespread. So you have like an old SQA robot, which is now rational IBM. And like all these things start to come together, right? So the, the, the idea comes up, it's like, OK, we're not going to have separate things. We're going to put QA on, on the Scrum team. That's going to be great. And you'll just sit and write the test. Maybe you're doing it in Cucumber or something like that. Um, or the other thing, uh, let's just outsource it, right? It's, it's not super important, so we'll just throw it away. Um, and have it done over there, and you know it'll be great. That's a brilliant business decision. But the, another important thing is the customer gets closer to the engineering department. At this time, operations, you ops people, come out of the back office, and you become more important, right? So, you know that you're important to the business because you're delivering online, and you're taking care of the systems that do that. The platform itself is the product, right? So especially like in e-commerce or something, your platform is the product, the thing that you're selling. So the, the ability to deploy those changes, shorten those maintenance windows, not have a lot of downtime, affect that change, becomes easier, and has a lot more business impact. It's visible. And at the time, you guys got it more important. We kind of got less in, in the test end of things. 2005, that came out, right? 2005. That's how long this kind of change came, you know, ha has been. So people start doing MVPs, right? So you don't have to have this fully baked thing done. And you're trying to learn as you go. So you don't have to, it, it's a process. You don't have to have it done all, all up front. So you're moving away from that kind of waterfall and spec and say, yeah, we can move faster, we can iterate. Mean time to remediation becomes the most important thing. You don't care that it breaks as much if you can fix the problem. Cost of failure is lower. No real physical product or supply chains to worry about. To turn something, you're just kind of pushing code to a server. It's very easy. You get more customer feedback. At this time, everything kind of gets reduced to automation. In the QA space, it's like, Oh, wait, QA, test, uh, you guys just write Selenium code. That's all you do. And we kind of internalized that, too. We kind of bought into that, right? So the thing that comes after that, wait, if we're just writing code, why don't we just let the developers do it? We don't need you guys. You're done. And then we get trapped in our tools. We, we stop thinking about the system. We, we're only, here's a spec, here's a... Um, Here's a page object model. We, we write that. It, it gets worse in cloud, right? You know, all those constraints start to be peeled off. Time to market becomes the most important thing. Correctness kind of goes, OK, we can fix that later. You know? Deployment automation starts to come in. More code. We need more code. We need more speed. This leads to where I think we are today. I like to call this the automation apocalypse. Companies like here, um, Mabel, uh, there's also some other companies, Functionize, Apple Tools. Machine learning and computer vision has gotten to the point where any kind of rote testing can be, can be done. Like 20 years ago when I was doing this, originally, you know, it's like, man, you always need a human because you'll never be able, you have the off by one pixel screenshot comparisons, that sort of thing. Right now, you can like upload swagger, your swagger into something, it'll generate tests for you. And then you can hook that up to your low testing automation. Or just upload your, your gold image, a third party service is gonna come and like hit, hit your things and see your changes and, and you're done. So for all of us QA folks who are like, yeah, we just do Selenium, Obsolete. But apps, man, it's your golden time right now. You have all this stuff. That pipeline that you have, all that automation, that is your product. Reliable, repeatable delivery, core business capability. 
down to, you know, are we down? No. Downtime, maintenance window? No, no. We don't do that anymore, right? But you're using so many different third-party systems and um, frameworks. You're, you're looking a lot more like a software system integrator than a sysadmin, right? So you have to do APIs over here. Um, here's the, uh, Jenkins and, you know, you have all this AWS and blah, blah, blah. All of these things are spread out. Do we need something with the mindset of experimental, curious? Do we still need that? Is there a place for that here? I think there is. Because the business right now doesn't know what it's doing. It's starving for information. They throw out an MVP and they're like, I need feedback. I don't know, should we use this, should we use that? So that information is critical so the business can either pivot or get the next iteration of its product out. So I think that mindset, that curious ex ex experimental mindset, it, it's, it's going to be valuable. But it's not going to be QA. It, it might not even be called test, right? All this infra needs to be tested. So how many of, of your admins here, how many people test your pipeline? right, as, as well as your product, have like CI, CD on your infrastructure code? A few, a few. So how many people think you should actually do that? <laughs> right. So there's, there's work to be done there. Um, performance and security become much, much more important. And uh, complex distributed systems, like in your cloud providers, um, that you need to confirm that behavior, and you can't really model it inside. I'll say it again, because it's really important. Test, test, test infrastructure code. Um, that resilience, of your, actually, the resilience of your distribution pipeline should be better than your product, right? Because that is what makes it so you can go fast on the product side. Software supply chain, also very important. So from a perf point of view, um, we're like throwing things all over the place. And we need to know it, not just on um, how fast we can reply to so, some request, but really for right-sizing infrastructure, right? To actually do performance you know, profiling. Because that, that'll cost real money. How many people in, in a cloud provider ever had something that was over-instanced. <laughs> yeah, you see that? And it's like money on fire. It's just like crazy. Um, so yeah, but how do, you, how do you get the right size instance? You test that. Um, exactly. Oh, that was my security slide. It didn't come through. But do we need security testing? Equifax, enough said. <laughs> Remember, pen testing has testing in the name, so there is more testing happening over there. This will become more and more important. God forbid you work in a compliance regime. The results of not, how much how much trouble do you think Equifax is in, right, with, with the, its regulators? You know, you're going you're, you're gonna to probably see the, like, some very large fines, then take care of the PCI, or, you know, you work in HIPAA, you start leaking uh, patient information, very bad things for your business. It can literally kill your business. Maybe you should test that, that audit and compliance, what you're going to be checked on is clean so your business doesn't die. The business also wants more and more information from users, right? So that's, you know, your business analysts, you have all these things to proxy it up front, um, you know, back in the old days. But now you can actually do tests on your users, right? That's A-B testing. How, how many folks are in shops that do A-B? A few. That's where test design becomes important. So you get good information on, on AB. The same thing with uh, real user monitoring, like RUM. So K 
Chaos. Chaos. That's supposed to say chaos engineering. Monkeys for the monkey god. I know. Chaos engineering. All right. Do you think Netflix can actually model the internet like in staging to test things? <laughs> no, it's like too big and too complex. I think even for some of our things, it's very hard to mimic now with so many third party services uh, and so much variability what's really, what's really going on. So you're gonna actually have to test in production. QA people, you're gonna, you love this. It's like, I get to break production? That is awesome. But from the upside, that resiliency and recoverability is very important for you to be actually able to do this. Otherwise, you're just burning down your own house. Um, so it's evolution on the path. So those destructive experiments, right, they prove the resiliency of your system. The exception is the rule. So uh, I said everything moved from mean time uh, between failure out to you know, recovery. And we don't really care. Things can fail. We're resilient, blah, blah, blah. IoT kind of flips it on its head. You're dealing with hardware. You have supply chain. Users might not update things. You probably want to test that better and have uh, go a little bit more on MBTF before it goes out. Because your cost of failure is higher. Try to get replacements out. You have physical products, um, security. People aren't going to update. You don't control the update. The user has to get it. So in conclusion, more code we get in ops-related stuff, more code needs to be tested. So we should know that, QA people. We should start to learn more operations things. That mindset is going to be super, super helpful. And really, for the business folks, what that cost of failure is should guide how much you do. And that is all. <laughs> So your, your talk is actually really timely for me personally because I just recently made a switch from QA to DevOps like a month and a half ago, um, which I've really been enjoying. It's been, it's been fantastic. Uh, one comment and then another question. And I found out yesterday that uh, all of the QA team that I used to work with, they've been let go. Yep. And so to your point, this is actually happening and it's real. Um, so I've inherited a bunch of, uh, we do all our, all our infra infrastructure in Terraform. Yep. Um, and the idea of testing that is just such a cool idea. I think I'd like to go to my boss and, and get that going. Um, how would you approach beginning something like that? Usually our testing process is we do a Terraform apply, and if things, a oh, Terraform plan, and yep. if things look like what we want them to look like, it's tested, And but obviously that's not um, as resilient or as thorough as it could be. You look, sound like yeah. you have an answer. So being here and walking around the room and seeing all the, the different vendor stuff, a lot of it is all focused from a DevOps perspective yep. on the delivery pipelines, the monitoring, the um, coming from a transition from that QA background to trying to fill out all the pieces in the pie. Where do you see, there's not a whole lot of automated testing people out there kind of filling in that group. Do you see some of those traditional, you know, cucumbers or, you know, selenium or being carried forward from an automated testing perspective to do faster, do that, or are those going the way of the dinosaur as well, or? Yeah, I, th I really think for, for some of that, um, it, it will as, um, uh, machine learning and computer vision solutions for that type of testing really start to get more mature. Right now, I'm just seeing the start of it. Um, I, you know, I was out at uh, Velocity San Jose, and I just ran into these, com you know, companies. I'm like, oh my god, this is, it's this is incredible. This actually works, you know. So, um, 
but I think from, if you think about it, these are just frameworks. And if you understand frameworks and you understand test design, you can easily jump to another framework or another domain, right? I think a lot of QA folks, a lot of testing folks that do kind of functional, automa uh, functional automation now, should probably, if they're really like that, really kind of think about specializing, right? Security, our, our, our lost brothers, <laughs> right? Let's, let's help those guys out. Um, let's, uh, you know, do more performance work. You know, these are translatable skills. You just have to learn a bit different domain. Oh, that, um, that actually kind of tied into my question, um, which is good here because one of the things, uh, we have a lot of folks, um, you know, on the traditional QA side, and they're looking, they're, they're seeing, you know, kind of the landscape evolve in front of them. Um, but right now, I feel like we're in a uh, uh, kind of a, a situation where experience is needed in order for your, your next gig to happen, right? Yep. Like, everyone is looking for somebody who's done that, not evolved into. So which, what, what other suggestions do you have for people who have been uh, in their traditional um, QA format? Seize the landscape. Like, is it self-learning and experimentation in their current gig to be able to then find a new one? Or, like, how do you make that leap, uh, yeah. I guess? Yeah, having made that leap, it's never, it's never really easy. Um, I think one of the big things is to go to your local DevOps meetup, and they're very welcoming, and you can start to learn that side of the house. Um, it's really easy to bootstrap. Um, uh, some self-learning, too, if you, if, if you like that. Uh, even better if you have, if you're on the QA team or the test team, if you take more control of your environments at the company you are. Like, so, so you can like self-service deploy your own environments, let's say out in the cloud, and really get in d more deeply involved in how that pipeline works. Um, that will take you steps on the path. Yeah, I feel like this is just another thing on the, the trend I've been seeing of it in the DevOps space is uh, DevOps becoming more jack of all trades and even expert of all trades and kind of a lot of these special specialist um, roles like QA and, and um, DBA roles are getting rolled into and expect, yeah. it's getting to the point where they're expecting, where a lot of companies are expecting one role and one person to do a lot of different things which require deep expertise. So what are your thoughts on that and how, you know, how do we deal with that? Yeah, so that, that's really kind of a management thing. It's, it's really about team formation. So, um, you know, you, you're like have T-shaped people, so you have a broad skill set and maybe one or two, one go deep or like pi because there's two and then there's one over thing. So you, your, your team, you want a, what I like to call a Tetris-shaped team, right? So you have all the different blocks and specialties and they just kind of fit together into that deep, solid square. Um, but to actually do that, you have to have management that understands that's how you build, build the team. I think these are kind of all trailing into each other. Um, from a traditional dev and test standpoint where you, you have an organization where it's hard to sell QA to management because nobody understands that you actually need to test software. Right. Um, and then transitioning into SDETs from a standard QA or STE. Right. Um, and now we have this DevOps thing, which is a difficult sell into management already. Exactly. <laughs> how do we um, how do we approach uh, selling QA for, for the pipeline or QA for the infrastructure? You know, if I had figured that out, I would have a consultancy <laughs> gig somewhere and make it a lot more. I think we'd all we'd all work together. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Ready for experiments. Is that it? One more? That's it. Catch me out in the hallway. I love to just talk about this. Thank you.